about the purpose that God has for us, and the title of the message is Follow Me. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 18, uh, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And uh, going from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee their father mending their nets. And he called them and immediately uh, and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. They followed Jesus uh, in a more or less straight path all the way till the Garden of uh, Gethsemane and uh, some to the cross, some to the tomb, but all of them to heaven. And it's amazing how God says, follow me. Uh, a lot of times we hear the expression, uh, follow me. Jesus told his disciples to follow him and he'd make them something that they weren't before. They had some level of understanding what that would be. We have a, a fellow down in Mystic there. He's a, he captains one of the uh, cruise boats and every time he goes by, he says, how's the fishing? <laughs> he stopped and talked a little bit. I wish I could remember the guy's name. At this point, I'm embarrassed to tell him I don't remember it. Uh, but uh, uh, we talked for a little bit and I said, well, the fishing's a whole lot better than the catching. And uh, the reality is, is that the Lord didn't tell us to be catchers of men. He told us to be fishers of men. So our job isn't to pull them in. Our job is to, to fish for them. However, there's a responsibility in the catch. Now, I don't know about you, but I, the, the, the worst thing is to, to catch something that's, that's good and, and let it go to waste. I've seen that. I've had it happen. I can remember one time my Uncle David and I, uh, my Uncle David is six months older than me. And he, he stayed back in the third grade so we could go through school together. We, we graduated the same year as my dad's youngest brother. And uh, we went fishing one time and uh, we're down on uh, Snake Road. Uh, it used to be called Snake Road. Now it says uh, West Salerno Road, I think, or something like that. Anyway, they gave it a more sophisticated name. <laughs> uh, but we went down to this old cow pasture and uh, we went swimming in there and, and these great big ditches that they dig down there. Uh, there's probably 10, 15 feet wide. Uh, when they're really full, they're probably six feet deep. The rest of the time, three or four feet deep. And it's got that black, gooky mud. You walk in it, and it just looks like a mud bath. And anyway, we're down there. We decided we'd go swimming. We weren't catching anything with, what, with worms, so we decided we'd go swimming. So we jump in, and we're splashing around there. And pretty soon, all we noticed was all these fish coming up to the top of the surface to breathe air because we so uh, churned up the water with mud, their gills were getting plugged up. And we started, it was just a little, little perch and stuff like that, they're probably this big. We started just scooping them up on the, on the shoreline. And we did that for, I mean, the, the excitement level was peaked out, man. We, we, <laughs> we, we had that uh, 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 post uh, pre-adolescent uh, adrenaline running full blast in there with all of the fish we were throwing up on the shore. And we got done and couldn't figure it out. Now what? Well, let's take them home. Grandma and David's mom would be just tickled to death. And uh, we found an old piece of wire laying in the field from, a, from barbed wire and we strung all them fish up. I, I bet we had probably 20, 25 pounds of fish. It, was, it took two of us to carry. It looked like something out of a, a jungle scene. You know? These two little kids were probably about this big, eight, nine, 10 years old, carrying them up the road there. And we thought we'd really done something. We, and we got up there and my grandma looked out the door and we were just, she probably thought we were on the wrong side of the, the, wrong side of the tracks. We were covered in that mud, had all these fish on there. She said, you boys gonna be busy. And I'm thinking, what is she talking about? She says, you, you better get busy cleaning them fish. You don't want to waste them. Man, we spent the rest of the afternoon cleaning them fish. If we didn't know we were going to have to clean them, we'd have left them there. We'd have put them back in the water and let them swim. I said all that to say this. Sometimes fishing is more fun than cleaning them and getting them ready to be uh, of service. And today, it seems like the idea of discipleship and a level of discipline, uh, disciplined life that goes beyond just catching. Catching's fun. 
is noticeably absent almost everywhere you go. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to study what it means to live for the Lord here. They just figure they know that because they're nice folks. Now, I want to talk to you about, I got, I don't know how many things here. We'll probably, by the time we get done, because I don't think we'll finish these tonight, but uh, maybe we'll put some of them off till next week. I probably got 15, 16 things here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one of them, but I don't think we're going to get it done in 40 minutes. So uh, I want to just talk about these things. Once that call is given and we've uh, decided to follow Jesus, there's some things that he expects. And for those that have begun to follow him, they expect us to follow. He expects us to follow willingly. This idea of a uh, uh, church call list where you have to go, oh, you know, it's Sunday tomorrow. Is there anybody who thinks that seriously you don't know that? People know when Sunday's coming. They know when Wednesday night prayer meeting's coming. What that's designed for is a little intimidation factor. You know, you ought to be there. Well, why don't you just call them and say, hey, we're tired of you being absent. Why don't you come? Get there. We need more people praying. We need some people serving the Lord here. But what it is, is uh, he wants us to follow willingly. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but look with me back in Genesis 24. I tried to come up with a little uh, illustration on any, each uh, one of these points that will not uh, belabor the point, but will uh, hopefully make it very pointed of what the Lord uh, uh, expects uh, of us. And this idea of doing things willingly is kind of interesting because uh, Abraham sends out his servant Eleazar to find a, husband, uh, a wife for his, uh, his son Isaac. And he gives him a list of things of what he wants and what he doesn't want. He says, don't get one from the Canaanites. Don't get one from that heathen bunch over there. Find somebody from a, from a good family out there. And if they're, if they're uh, willing to come, you bring them, uh, bring them back. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, if uh, there was somebody in your family and you had a young lady who was single and dad says, uh, uh, you go find a husband or go find a wife for uh, my son. What would you go looking for? Wouldn't you know him? Wouldn't you know the son? Wouldn't you know what he was after? And uh, I guess he'd probably talked with his servant and this servant might have made it a, a very specific point to talk to the, uh, to the son there. It doesn't give any record of that, but it's hard to imagine that didn't happen. If, uh, what do you think about those tall girls or the short girls? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you, Trying to, what are you looking for? And then we'll see what the Lord does. So in um, Genesis 24 and verse uh, verse five, uh, the word of God says this, uh, and the servant said unto him, peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me into this land. Must I needs bring thy son into the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham says, nope. She don't want to come, leave her there. My son's not going anywhere else. My son's got a place to be. You know what that tells me? You're not going to bring Jesus down and put him in this worldly environment. He wants to take you and bring you is because we're the bride. We're the, we're the, uh, the prize of his eye. Uh, we're going to be taken where he is. We're going to be converted to be what he wants. He's not changing. He's not moving. He's not going anywhere to satisfy anybody in this world. Uh, so uh, she has to be ready to go. So when all of this comes about, uh, let's see here. She, he meets Rebecca by the well. I, I hope everybody knows this story. Uh, and they have a bit of a discussion and he, uh, he's looking for somebody and he says, uh, I need some water for me and for my animals here, or for me. And uh, she runs and she starts getting water for him for the animals, for everything. You know what that is? That's somebody that has, is perceptive to the needs of others. Uh, my, my son, uh, my son, my grandson, Jesse, is, uh, is old enough now to notice girls. He's over 12. So uh, uh, he's finally got a, a fairly serious girlfriend. And I, said, I asked him a while back, I said, does she have a job? He said, no. And I said, is she lazy? <laughs> well, no, I don't think so. At that point, her, her parents didn't want her to work, which you know, that's, that's fine. They, they know their daughter. They know what the circumstances are. Well, since then, she's got a job and I guess does okay at it. 
But I tell them, I said, Jess, whatever you do, you, do, you never want to marry a lazy woman because you will forever regret it. You will be Mr. Everything. You will be uh, trying to fill in all of the things that are lacking in her life, and what fails will be your fault because you chose her. Well, anyway, he finds a woman, that's a young woman who's willing to work, willing to, used to doing things, and is perceptive enough to see to, see to the needs of others. And he, uh, he uh, lays out the story again to, uh, uh, to her family. And he brings gifts and shows her how good he is. Doesn't the Bible say the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? He comes, he brings bracelets and this and that. Well, he's just trying to bribe her. I think he's trying to let her know, uh, you're, you're, this is a pretty good family. This is not somebody that's on welfare. This is not somebody that uh, is, is needy and all that kind of stuff. They're not out here looking because nobody in town wants anything to do with them. They're out here looking because they're looking for somebody special, for a special child. This is the child of God's promise. And don't want him to be tied up to the wrong person to, to mess up his life. But the key is, is that she has to be willing. And he ultimately asked the father, and of course, yeah, that's great, but uh, down here, way down toward the end of chapter 24, and uh, it says down here, I thought I had written down the notes on this, but apparently I didn't write on all the verses out that I wanted to use. Uh, anyway, in verse 56, and he said unto to them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel, inquire at her mouth. They want to know, is she, she going to go? And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? Now, he probably didn't bring a portfolio of graduation pictures and, you know, job resume and all that kind of stuff. He just presented it as a, as a pretty wealthy man that can send out a servant across the countryside with a, uh, with a, a camel loaded with goods and, uh, and wealth to uh, put down as a dowry for a bride for a son that's, that's going to be coming back. And uh, she probably reasons all these things of, hmm, you really wonder what's going through her mind. She has no idea what this guy looks like. She has no idea whether he can speak and put two syllables together <laughs> or whether you're trying, golly. But she says, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said, her, said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. Don't you know that's exactly what God did? He's got that plan into works. One of these days, the family that she married into is going to rule over the entire world. That's not a bad deal for a blind date. You think, well, I wouldn't do that today. No, nobody would do anything today that uh, didn't suit their fancy. But this one seemed to suit God's because it, the marriage prospered and God uh, did all kinds of things. It's kind of interesting. Uh, down to verse 65, uh, verse 64. Let me back up to 63. <laughs> we'll be back to verse 1 in a minute. 63, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the eventide. What do you suppose he's thinking about? Where that Eliezer is. <laughs> I wonder how long he's going to be gone. I wonder what he's going to be back with. I wonder what he found out there. I wonder what family that's from. <laughs> This guy's probably got this stuff spinning in his head because he's thinking about what his father wanted. His father wanted a way for him. It's time. You ever think about that? Lord Jesus wants to have a bride every bit as much as that bride wants to see him. One of these days the father says, today's the day. This is the minute. Go get her. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. I, that's, that's not an R.J. Reynolds commercial. For she had, unto, uh, had said unto a servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. 
And Isaac brought her into his, his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You know, when the church ends, you and I find comfort and solace here. When the mother of us all, the church ends, we're comforted in the arms of the bridegroom forever. What a glorious uh, end to this, to this adventure called the church. When the Lord calls us, and we're no longer a called out people, but a called in people. And God brings us home at the eventide as this, in the twilight of this age. Everything winds down. You know what? We need to follow him. We need to follow him willingly. And when you find people that want to follow the Lord willingly, they're excited. They're anticipatory in life. Everything is, I wonder what the Lord has for me today. I wonder what the Lord wants me to do today. I wonder what excitement God has for me today. I wonder what the preacher's going to preach about Sunday night. I wonder who's going to be there Sunday, Wednesday, because I gave some people tracks, invited them out. Is anybody going to come? You know what? You got to do that in order to live in that level of anticipation. Because if you don't, what are you expecting? They can't even expect you. <laughs> Let alone be a part of a crowd that I've done my part. I can't wait to see what God brings in. Maybe nothing. I mean, week after week after week, we go do things, pass out tracts, witness to people. Boy, it comes out. Uh, nothing that we can see. But I don't think for a minute God's not doing anything with all that stuff. God's working whether we see the end result of it or not. He's not, he's not uh, depending on our pat on the back to keep up with his end of the bargain. Our job is to, uh, to scatter that seed. His job is to provide the increase. When he does, glory, hallelujah. When he does it, we had people come to church and say, we're little kids. You know what? You water that seed, you pull weeds around that seed, you kind of nurture that seed. Man, at times you want to just dig it up and see if some, some bug came along and ate it. But if you're patient, in due season, we'll reap if we faint not. The Lord will bring something out of there. And it, sometimes it's glorious. Anybody here, uh, uh, it's, uh, I can't remember now what the name of it is. They, they call it a, a corpse flower. It only blooms once every 80 years. They, they typically have these things in those big greenhouses, and it's a big kind of a tropical kind of thing. And when the thing comes up, it blooms only for a couple of days, and it smells like a dead body. But the, the flower is beautiful, but it's the rarity of it that's the attraction. It's the unusual nature of it that's the attraction. Who would wait 80 years to smell a dead body? You can probably go down to... Well, <laughs> people waiting they live in anticipation a farmer oh wow I've been my gardener I've been waiting for this I planted this when I was a kid <laughs> lucky you it'll smell just like you follow willingly you know it's kind of interesting you think about uh, church and uh, you see some some preachers they're they're very forceful and you got to do this. You got to. You know, I understand that, but you know something that the shepherd of Israel, his job was to lead. The cattle driver's job is to drive. And if God's people don't follow, what do you do? The shepherd will go pick them up. Maybe he'll wait till they're crying out in the wilderness, but he'll bring them in eventually. You know, the problem is, all the while we're wondering, do they really belong to the shepherd? Maybe they're she sheep from some, something else that just kind of wandered in and they didn't really belong to that shepherd. That's what, what plagues us, or at least me. If I knew for sure they were saved, I'd probably worry less about them. It's the not knowing that's the painful part. Follow willingly. Leave your family with a glorious testimony should anything, God forbid, anything should happen to you, your children, your family. They were saved. They knew the Lord. They trusted in Him. And they're with, with uh, the Lord in heaven now. Follow, follow, follow. I will follow Jesus right to the, to the gates of Zion and on inside. 
Rebecca followed willingly, and the Lord blessed her. In chapter 25, verse 5, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. That girl didn't have any idea what she was getting into. She just was willing to go. There's something else in, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. He said uh, uh, unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Very few people catch fish by accident. You know why? When I was a young man, <laughs> my dad was, a, was one of those throw a hook and line over with bait on it and let it sit there. I was too restless for that. I wanted to cast. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do everything. And my, my dad, after a while, would get a little bit frustrated. He says, you can't catch any fish if, you're, if your lure isn't in the water. And it's just the, the perplexities of youth and the, uh, the trials of different people's uh, uh, interest. Some people want to just plug along and be very faithful and, and durable. Other people want to, let's go here, let's go there. They're not biting. Let's run over there. Let's sit. I don't know that there's an absolute answer in those things. I'd like to give you one. I'm not sure there is. I think God has some people that want to fish one way and some that fish another. Anybody in here, here I know John does, go trout fishing. You don't use a shiny plug that long, do you? No, that'd be bigger than half the fish you catch. But if you went blue fishing with a little fly like that, you'd be wasting the day because all you're going to get is wet. You have to use bait that, the, that that fish can can associate with and see as something it's interested in. You have to use the equipment that's capable of accomplishing those things. And you see too many people today, they're out fishing for whales with uh, one of them little pink Zebco uh, fishing reels, you know, or, Use it in the living room most of the time to catch the, catch the rug or something. You've got to have some serious equipment. You know what God gave us? He gave us everything we need to pull in the biggest catch that uh, is available on this planet. Right there. And you start messing with them other Bibles, you might get a few nibbles now and then, but you never even be sure you got a bite. You don't know what they're interested in. Just an easier way or the Lord himself. We need to follow with an absolute purpose. Every purpose, the Bible says in Proverbs 20, 18, is established by counsel. We have the counsel, the wisdom, the admonition from the living God. Prepare yourself for every good work. Once you get ready, you can walk out that door, witness to people. Say, well, I still don't know everything. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Anybody think John the Apostle knew everything? Anybody think Peter knew everything? Listen, nobody knows everything. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, nobody knows the day or the hour of his coming. I'm not even sure he knew then. I'm sure he knows now. But he, not everybody knows everything. And we don't need to know everything. You know something? The minute you get saved, you know enough to lead a soul to Christ. Because all you've got to know is how you got there. And if you can't do that, you better retrace your steps. Did you get to Christ or did you get to somebody's answer that was trying to pump you for something? We need to be fishers of men. That fishers of men means that at times you have to get up early. At times you have to stay up late. At times you have to fish by firelight. There are other times when the bugs and the, and the insects are out. And there are times when it's just raining and uncomfortable and miserable. But if you want to catch fish... You choose the tide. You don't choose the comfort level. I'm, I'm one of those fishermen when you get down to really fishing. By and large, if it's not a nice day, I'm not interested. And a lot of people live out their entire Christian life, spiritually speaking, like that. And there's never the right day for it. You know, you talk to them, well, you know, not, this is not a good time for that. This is not the right time. For, I'm not really prepared for that. I, I just, I don't have any tracks. In my, I don't have this. Be ready. Make it your purpose of life to follow the Lord's will. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Be ready to tell them what good thing the Lord's done for you. Be ready to tell them uh, what a life it is to live for the Lord. You know, a, a lot of folks, they think, well, if I get saved, I'll be as miserable as you. If I get saved, I'll just have to live that dull uh, sluggard's life. Of, oh, I got to go to church. 
I, I think I ought to go to prayer meeting. Everybody will talk about me if I don't go. And uh, I got to give some money. And Anybody here want blessings from God? Well, put something in it so God can give you something in return. You, you can't get blessed for doing nothing. You, you got to have something going on to, to get the blessings that God has. And so many of our young folks, they, they just don't see that. I remember years ago, we had a bunch of kids and every now and then one of them would come along and all it takes is one. You take a group of 10 kids, they could be 10 duds. And you put one firecracker in there and next thing you know, you got 11 kids stirred up to go out and witness, to pass out tracts, to do something. And I guess church is a lot like that, only as you get older, you get more resistant to, to any kind of change at all. But uh, I've seen those kids really stir that crowd up. And when that kid's gone, it's like the tide going out. Everything else went with it. Just, what's that all about? It's about encouraging one another. And if you see somebody starting to, to fade by the wayside, flagging out and just kind of uh, go help them. Pick him up, try and encourage him, try to get him excited again about serving the Lord. You know, one of the things that testimonies does, and it, it, it's, at the same time, it's the reason so many churches are terrified of them. They don't have testimonies. Uh, I've, I've seen lots of places where if you, if you ask the preacher, you have testimonies? No. Do. Why? Well, brother so-and-so, man, he'll talk all night. About what? About himself. About how bad his tooth hurts or... I'm all for prayer requests. I'm all for personal testimonies. But how about uh, doing something that God could really glory in? How about let's use every opportunity. Let's purpose in our life to be successful. To be, uh, uh, by successful, I don't mean filling up this, the, the road next to you. That would be certainly beyond successful. Successful is just doing what God told you to do. Scatter that seed. Be the witness he wants you to be. Jesus said the purpose in saving your soul was so it would allow you to carry the words of eternal life to friends and family. My friends, that is at one time both an obligation and the greatest privilege. God didn't entrust the angels with that message. He gave it to you and I. Those angels could talk about it. We can tell of it. We have been there. You talk to lost people and you realize they, they don't have any idea what goes on in your heart. You talk to the, the average professing Christian about being excited about the Lord, being excited about going to church and the anticipation of what the preacher's gonna preach and they look at you like, are you crazy? <laughs> you out of your mind? How, how could you be excited about any of that stuff? How could that hold any great fascination for you? Because they relate it to whatever it is they're doing. And there's nothing in their life they could be excited about like that. Certainly not God. Certainly not preaching, certainly not going to church. When you tell them, yeah, you go Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. <laughs> Man, their, their eyes begin to glaze over. I hope everybody enjoys it. I mean, I, I realize there are times that I can be uh, uh, probably more boring than a uh, uh, drying paint. But God's pretty good, isn't he? Every now and then, God will stir you up. Every now and then, God will just kick you in the shins. And hey, what do you think about that? What are you going to do about that? And you say, about what? <laughs> oh, well, pay attention. Think about this. You and I have an answer this entire world needs. There's not a single living soul on this earth that does not need to know what you and I take for granted every minute of the day. How to have their sins forgiven. And you bring that to the world. That's not a big deal. If it was a, a, a coupon for a free slice of pizza, they'd be ripping your arm off trying to get it out of your hand. But eternal life, eh, not so much. If you had a cure for a disease, if you had, you know, I found the cure for cancer, but it's very unpleasant. You have to take this medicine. It tastes awful. You don't want it. Give it. Give it to me. He said, I got the cure for death. I got the cure for hopelessness. I got the cure for a failed life. Really? What is it? <laughs> it's Jesus. Oh, come on. They, they just cannot fathom that could be the case. You and I know it's true. We've experienced those kind of things. 
The purpose of our lives is to try and convey to them the fellowship, the, uh, the joy of representing a, a thrice holy God who allows sinners to come into his presence to get washed clean so they can live forever with him. And he can reward them simply for being blessed more. What is the manner of our lives? It'll be a very purposeful life. You ask the average person today, why are you alive? Most of them just stare at you like, what do you mean? The idea of purpose in life, if it isn't to have fun and get a lot, they, they, there's no conception of anything greater than that. But you know what God says? He says, you and I, and them as well, have been created with one, one purpose in mind, to please Him, to bring joy to Him. They cannot do it. You and I can, but will we? And therein lies the rub. It has to be a Christian life lived with purpose to bring joy to the Lord, blessings to others, and peace in the family of God. As in giving, the Bible says, every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give. Listen, there, there's a, I think that verse is written on that little thing on the offering box back down there. But I'm going to tell you something. How much of your life you give to the Lord is how much you've purposed to give because it doesn't happen by accident. You could, you could say, well, I'm going to live for the Lord this week and sit back waiting. I'm just waiting for God to come carry me and, and put me wherever he wants me to be and do whatever he wants me to do. And that's not how it works. He expects us to use the intelligence, the wisdom, the, the be led by God's Spirit to do things and to honor Him by that life. What's your purpose? What's your manner of living? Give glory to God? Sometimes we do it in words, but our lives hardly reflect that. And it ought to be, quite frankly, both. It ought to be everything that we have. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praising. You think the trees, the rocks. Man, I don't know if it's literal or it's just a figurative expression that even a dumb rock got, got sense enough to sing to the Lord and praise Him. But God uses those expressions when Jesus comes back to fir trees, clap their hands. I didn't even know they had hands. They clap their hands. The, 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 uh, the rocks cry out, here He comes, glory to God. He told them that uh, God was able to raise up children to Abraham out of those rocks if you wouldn't praise Him. And they just, well, yeah, we just weren't raised to do that. We're very sophisticated. We're, I was Episcopalian, you know. We didn't do that. Anybody said amen there, they'd look at you funny and escort you out the door, thinking there's something wrong with you. We need to follow willingly. We need to follow with a, with a uh, dire sense of purpose. Anybody know how long you're going to live? I do. I, I know exactly how long you're going to live. A lifetime. <laughs> Now, if I want to put a number on that. I, one lifetime, I guess, would be it. But uh, you got to live till you die. What are you going to do with that life? Thief on the cross had minutes, maybe an hour, before he died. But you don't ever hear of another word out of his mouth. Wouldn't it be something if the last words out of our mouth was, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom? rather than, oh, God, help me, I'm hurting. <laughs> how, much, how much am I going to have to leave behind? Everybody got something to say at the last minute. I, I remember reading books of uh, famous sayings of, of the dead and dying. And there was one real rich guy, I, I remember now who it was, uh, and he's laying in a room there and all of his big shot friends are around and He's looking at them, and they're looking at him, and they're all just waiting for him to die, hoping they get a cut of the pie. And uh, he's laying there thinking, it's, man, this curtain's for me. It's about all over. And he looks around and says, ain't nobody in there cares about anything. He just looked at his friends. He says, when I'm gone, tell them I said something important. That's pathetic, isn't it? Tell them I said something important. I got a message for him. I said, tell him, call on Jesus Christ before they die. 
Why don't you tell them to live a life filled with willingness and purpose of life to follow Him so that when you're dying, you're not surrounded by people who couldn't care less, but people who are going to miss you dearly until they see you again and have that guarantee from God that we're going to enjoy that fellowship forever. We're going to have a reunion that is going to be one to put the cap on all family reunions forever. Tell them I said something important. <laughs> Look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 22. Let me start reading verse 19. A certain scribe came. And said unto him, Master, I will follow thee wherever, wheresoever thou goest. Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Well, what did he say that for? And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Is he dead? Oh, no, he's not dead. <laughs> He's pretty good health, but you're going to die in about 20 years, and, and when he dies, I'll come follow you. Is that what it? No, that's not what it says. I'm just... You kind of wonder, though, don't you? Must have seemed like a better offer to wait for bury the dead than go live with Jesus. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. There's something interesting about all that stuff. You know where God wants to lead us? He wants to lead us into that abundant life that God, uh, Lord Jesus spoke about over in John 10.10. 10. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So he wants us to uh, have that life, have joy. You think from some people's uh, kind of Christian life, what God wants us to put on a solemn face. You see some of those old time uh, denominations and lines. If you ever had a smile on your face, they'd think you were up to something. Just, you must be guilty of something. Nobody in our church smiles. It's sort of a sin of uh, uh, omission that you smile. But the truth is, is that God wants us to be happy. You know what the testimony is of a, of a good family? Happy children. When the children are suffering, long face and droopy and... <clears throat> what's the matter? <clears throat> How's your parents? <clears throat> you got any toys? <clears throat> There's something wrong. There's something wrong. I love watching little kids. And some people, well, they're, they're irritated. Yeah, of course they are. <laughs> I think they're supposed to be. You, you can't wait until they grow up. And then when they grow up, it causes you to rethink your whole position. Say, man, what did I ever wish that for? Why couldn't they just stay little forever? Big enough to pick up and carry and tuck them in and, you know, have them fake going to sleep so they'd want you to carry them in and put them into bed. Those, those are the days. I wonder sometimes if the Lord don't look at us and say, I liked you better when you were little. Back then you needed me. Back then you didn't think you know it all. Back then you weren't too self-sufficient to have me help you with something. Now you think you outgrew me. You know where our joy ought to be? In fellowship with the Lord. And the minute we get out of fellowship with the Lord, I'm going to tell you something. I know this for a fact. I've dealt with people for 40 years, 45 years with this. They get in, in fellowship with God and their life is just glory. And then they get out. And you go talk to them, say, why don't you get back and fellowship? Mm, I, I don't know. I just, you know, it, it was okay. And I, you know, I enjoyed it. And what was the bad part of it? Well, there really wasn't any bad part. Oh, what are you doing now? Why are you not in fellowship with the Lord? Why don't you get rid of whatever it is that's pulling you away? Why don't you pull down those barriers and uh, uh, dump those obstacles? Get rid of anything that's in your way between you and the Lord and fellowship. Uh, if you, you know, if you and I would be absolutely honest, the happiest moments of our entire existence are when the Lord and I are just sitting at a table smiling at each other. There's nothing between us. There's no issues. And it's, it's like we're just waiting. Lord, what do you want me to do? Let's, let's go do something. Let's, let's have some excitement. Let's, let's, let's just be together. And you separate in that. 
And it, sometimes it's so difficult. You see people go just torment themselves with life being away from God. You know, what is, what is the advantage of that? There, there's some perverse pleasure in man's nature to hold God at a distance. It's almost like I've got power over God now. I can tell him to just step, step out of my business. Yeah, but you know, if you'd give it a half a thought, what do you gain by doing that? How in the world are you benefited by putting God off? If the happiest times are when you're in perfect fellowship with the Lord, shouldn't we strive? Shouldn't we willingly and with purpose of heart and mind and will do everything we possibly could to get as close as we possibly can and put up the boundaries around us to keep the rest of the world out? But we don't or at least we seldom do. There are people that uh, spend much of their lives looking over their shoulders, lamenting what could have been, what might have been, if only I'd married so-and-so, if only so-and-so hadn't ran out on me, if only this had happened this way, if only that job had gone through, if only this. Yeah, but it didn't. Why, why live your life daydreaming about what might have been when the glorious possibilities of God intervening in the very affairs, the moment by moment affairs of your life is right there. And he said, call unto me and I'll answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things you've not dreamed of. Well, Lord, I, I just didn't think you'd do it. He says, I told you, I'm able to do above all that you're able to ask or think. Well, yeah, Lord, I know that, but uh, there's, no, there's no reasoning in that. There, there's no answer to that. There's no excuses in that. That's just a level of insanity. Thinking, I'm going to be better off without the God of eternity than I am with Him. How does that make sense to anybody? But from the way people react, you've got to understand, that's how they think. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, anybody remember uh, a book about a, a lady who was taken uh, prisoner in, uh, in uh, the Philippines in World War II? Uh, Darlene Ross, is that her name? Uh, Darlene Diebler Ross, I think was her name. She was taken prisoner by the, uh, by the Japanese there. And she's recounting her times as a, as a POW in a Japanese uh, camp in the Philippines. The Japanese, in, in spite of all of their politeness and ancestor worship, don't think much of you and I. And they didn't think anything of their enemies. There was no milk of human kindness available for them. As a matter of fact, on the Bataan Death March, the prisoners they had, there was women and children and soldiers and civilians. And uh, when the babies or the women would fall down, they'd take the babies and throw them up in the air and catch them on bayonets. He said, what was that for? Terror just to terrify people. You slow down, you fall down, this is you. You ain't slowing us down, we've got things to do. She, she gives an account of whoever was her, her Bible instructor at one point. And uh, she asked him something to the effect of, what was the greatest kind of personal revelation God ever gave him? And he said, to have lived a life with no regrets. Anybody know what that means? Not, what did I do that for? Even if you got away with it, ah, your conscience doesn't let you loose. Nobody else might have seen it, but you did, and the Lord did. And if nothing else, one day you're gonna face it. A life with no regrets. Friends, that's what we ought to have. Say, well, I've got a lot of them. Cut them off then. Don't make any more. Put the Lord ahead of everything. Put him the first of everything. You'll never have to apologize to him for that. Say, well, what about everybody else? What about them? If they're right with God, they'll recognize it and go along with you. And if they're not, it won't matter. Pretty soon they'll be way out of your life and you'll never see them again. One more thing and we'll be done for the evening. Matthew 16, 24.
Matthew 16, 20, uh, 24, Jesus had just told Peter that he didn't savor the things of God, but the things that be of men. And in 24, he says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall I give a man in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. You know what we need to do after Jesus uh, saves us? Follow his invitation. Come after him, take up our cross, and die daily. Paul said he'd fought with the wild beasts at Ephesus. He said he, he protested, protested their rejoicing. He says, I, I die daily. There were some people living just in such a way that we're child, children of the king. Anybody remember that? That's probably 20 years ago. We're a child of the king. You should live like that. Have a big fancy car. Have this. Have that. Have the other thing. Do blah, 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 blah. Well, I'm all for that. I mean, if, if the Lord gives it to you, anything you get by work and by God's blessing, hallelujah. Cursed be me. If I try and condemn you for what God's give you, if he thinks you're worth it, Amen. But if you're replacing God with those things, man, you're making a bad deal, a really, really bad deal. His invitation was to deny yourself, take up his cross, take up your cross, and follow him. You know that rich man in Luke 16? He had an opportunity to do something nice for Lazarus, but he never did it in his life. He had an opportunity to get right with God, just like Lazarus did, but he didn't do it. He could have been the man God could use to be a blessing for every, uh, every uh, scabby old, old uh, character in his whole neighborhood. Didn't do anything. He gets to hell and he regrets it. He wants to be an evangelist. He wants God to, to give him some comfort. He wants this and he wants that. You know, his life didn't change even in hell. It's still all about him. It's still all about what he wanted how he wanted to do it, and do it his way. You know, one thing you ought to learn by that? If you can't have your way in this life, you ain't going to get it in hell either. So your best bet is to sell out to the Lord Jesus Christ, turn it over to him, live willingly, follow him willingly, follow him purposefully, follow him joyfully, accept his invitation to take up that cross and die daily and count on the fact that that abundant life is going to come just like he said it would when you do what he says and not any other way ever. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to be one of the happiest people in the world. Whether you have anything or whether you have nothing. Whether you're healthy or whether you're sick. Whether you ever find Mr. Right or Miss Wonderful, or whether you live out your life just you and the Lord, you're going to be one of the happiest people around. Because God said He would keep you happy. He would keep you joyful. He would give you the desires of your heart if you just gave Him the heart to fill with those desires. I think He means exactly what He says. I, I, one thing I love about the Bible, when God says something, it might be 66 books later, but when God told Adam, have dominion over the earth, he says, well, that Adam failed, but the next one that comes from glory, he's going to get it. Way over in that last book of the Bible, you know what he is? You find Jesus on a, thr a throne in, a, in a, a jeweled city, ruling over the universe with glorified people under him, just coming to enjoy their life. And the devil locked up in the, in the place that some people choose because they think God's just too tough on them. Man, make some smart moves while you can. If you got things you regret, cut off that decline. Don't add anything to them. Don't add one more thing to it. Do what God wants. Let him bring you ahead. Let him fill your heart with his joy and his, uh, his blessings. Like that uh, servant Eleazar seeking a bride, the decision to follow must be yours. Protestant theology is, well, I could just decide to get baptized and get to heaven. No, you can't. 
That's what Calvinists think. When you, when you uh, decide to trust Jesus, they think that's a work. That's, that's, that's why these people are so confused today. They think believing what God told you to believe is works now. No, I've just changed my will. I don't, I don't have to blink. I don't have to, I don't have to draw another breath to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no works. It's just trust. I'm just taking him at his word. Mormons think you can baptize people for the dead. So they, uh, they have people come in and pay them money to get baptized for dead relatives. So the dead relatives go to heaven. Catholic Church has the, the, uh, the uh, what they call the treasure chest of Tetzel, the gold mine of the Catholic Church. If you, if you uh, throw money in the, in the uh, offering, all of a sudden that purgatory is gonna fly out of, the, out of purgatory and uh, now they're free. Really? They're not going anywhere without the blood of Jesus and if they're dead, too late to put it on there. Gotta be your choice. You and I can be an influence, we can be a witness, we can be a testimony. We can be a thriving example. But every man, every woman, every child must decide for themselves whether they want to follow Jesus or not. If they do, glory to God. If they don't, there's one more bad decision that goes in that repertoire of regrets that they will live long enough because they'll have eternal life, just not with Jesus. Let's stand. Amen. Amen. Give me a number. Ten. Number 10. God is good, isn't he? <laughs> All the time. <laughs>